Good morning, everybody. How are we all doing? Sammy, United People's TV, it's 11th of March. It's Monday, kicking off a new week. After a win, three points at a weekend, top four chases on. No, it's probably not. And we are some way off Liverpool and City after watching that game yesterday. Boy. But good morning to everybody. It's the biggest week of the year, of course, because it's my birthday this week. So, you know, cancel all your plans. I'm not really doing much, can't even walk. Not much of a birthday. But anyway. We're going to run through a full roundup of the weekend's news. We'll speak about the game against Everton. We'll speak about the positives. There's a couple of them. Uh, we'll speak uh, about the questions. And there's, well, how many questions are there to ask about United? There are a lot. We'll speak about Villa and Spurs. That was a big result. We'll speak about, we're going to take a look at the Premier League table, all the remaining games. We'll run through lots of other talking points. Tyrell Malassia. I swear to you, that might even be my lunchtime video today. Like, what on earth has happened with Tyrone Manasseh? And can you sack an entire medical department at once? Don't know. Anyway, we'll speak about some positive injury news ahead of the game against Liverpool this weekend, and that's a big one, and lots more. And as always, I'm going to answer as many of your questions throughout this show as I can. Who's here from the member gang? Let's have a quick look. Uh, good morning to you, Kenny. Mate, there's an absolute green army down there. Every single week, this community puts a smile on my face. Really, really does every single day. I love doing this show. It's just like it's a part of my, it's a part of my routine as much as it's part of yours. Obviously, wouldn't be part of your routine if I wasn't here. Be a bit weird that. Anyway, Natasha, good morning to you. Off key, we've got um, Toby, Saeed, Josh. Good morning to you. Hope you're doing well, mate. Anuj, got Carl, and you're there. T, I saw you at the start as well, sneaking in. Carl, Everton, Thomas, Andrew, Wright, Mania, Sandman, Andy Parker, um, Hybrid Hunter. Good morning to all of you. Who's on Facebook? Let's have a quick look. Uh, Thomas Hayes, Graham, Jeremiah. Uh, we've got um, Chris Wynn. We've got a couple more names here. Let's go through. There's loads on YouTube. Uh, John Lane and Mas Masage? Masage? Don't know. I think it's might just not, might just annihilate your name. But look, good morning, everybody. Hope you enjoy it. Fire in your comments throughout the show. Let's enjoy it. Said that twice. Let's talk about this game yesterday, right? Oh. Um, it was really impressive what Liverpool did. And the reason I'm happy that Klopp is leaving is because of the impact he's had on that Liverpool team in the same way that Liverpool fans would have celebrated uh, when Fergie left uh, because of how influential that manager was and how influential Klopp has been. And Liverpool are just, they've got another gear this year, of course. Uh, Danny is saying, can we not talk about this game? I mean, we have to, right? This is where we want to be. We don't want to be the side bitch anymore. <laughs> We're not even that. I don't know what we are. We're like the forgotten ex. And we obviously play Liverpool at the weekend. But it was just with Salah missing, with Trent missing. In that second half, Liverpool just turned it up a notch. And if I was a United fan and Doku did that to a United player and we didn't get a penalty for that, I would be livid. I don't know how you can't give a penalty for that. It's like, what's his face? Nigel De Jong against, who did he do it to? Was it World Cup final we did that? Just like booted someone right in the chest there. Steve Brooks saying, draw, best result for us. <laughs> I don't think that result really matters for us. But Arsenal, just do it. For, for the love of God, just don't be Arsenal. All right? Javi Alonso, that's who he did it to. Just, just figure out a way to do it. Ronnie, I know if you're watching this, I know you don't want Arsenal to win because you. <laughs> Ronnie works on United People's TV. His brother, United, his brother's an Arsenal fan. He's like, oh, man, I can't deal with it. I cannot deal with it. Just don't let it be Liverpool. Don't let it be City. Arsenal, just, just do, just do it, please. Um, but that right there is where we want to be. Right here. Right at the top of the table, that's where we want to be. That's where we're aiming to get to. Now, it is a process, all right? And it will take time. It's not to say, and, and, I, and I repeat this every week, it's, it's almost like United fans right now are in some sort of civil war. I, I, don't know how, I don't know how best to describe it, but there's just a lot of United fans on edge because we're having to, we, we've had to sit there and watch both Liverpool and City dominate the league for like how many years now six seven 
And you're saying if Arsenal win, the, you'll never hear the end of it. I don't care, man. I, I do not care. I, I thought that Liverpool winning the league would be the worst thing in the world for me. They won it. They won it in front of an empty stadium. And no one even talks about it. And I do not care. It had zero impact on me. City, if they win this, it's four in a row. Fuck that, man. They're filthy cheats. And embezzling... Well, sod that, man. Screw that. Arsenal. Done. Well, I hope so. Well, it's not done. It's a complete opposite of done. But this is a result which impacts us more directly in the course of this season. All right? It was a huge game, really, for Aston Villa. It was a huge game for both of them. Um, I think that now puts Spurs with two points behind Villa. Yeah, two points behind Villa with a game in hand. So if Aston Villa had won that game, it would have been huge for them. But they got absolutely Poor. destroyed. Absolutely destroyed. 4-0 win for Spurs. Very impressive. Uh, and Postacoglu is just, yeah, he's, 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 done, he's done well. What do you think would have been the best? I suppose the best result there would have been a draw for United, right? I mean, it, it definitely would have been. It would have been Spurs and Villa both dropping points. Um, John McGinn, again, that was a definite red card. That was just, I don't know why anybody's even arguing it wasn't a red card. How does it leave you feeling after after that weekend? I suppose that's a semi-positive weekend of results. Positive in the fact that United got three points. Now, we'll speak about the performance. We'll speak about the individuals against Everton. We'll speak about the problems. And we'll speak about, there's lots of things that we can run through from the Everton game. All right, I've already done my match reaction, but I'd like to speak about this live with you in the morning show on the Monday as well. All right, so we're now, let's have a look. We're eight points behind Villa with 10 games to go. So a maximum of 30 points left. And we've got a close a gap of near, what's that like? 20, I don't know, nearly 30% point change. Sam, the table is not correct. Well, this is the table from the BBC, dude. So I don't see how this isn't correct. But let me just go on here on the Premier League.com. And let's go to the table. And let's pull this up here. And let's pull up what looks to me like the exact same table. Okay. Right. So let me see. Let me see what was wrong with this table then. Spurs in fifth. 53 points. Left in a bit there. Played 27. Nope. That's the exact same table there. Okie dokie. That was a good waste of time. Right. What do you think about the rest of this season. We, we spoke about this um, before the weekend. Liverpool and City have got to... Uh, dude, Chris, man. Doesn't matter that Liverpool and City have played one extra game. Right, seriously. <laughs> anyway, I'll get back into the show. I I'm, I'm apologise to everybody that was annoyed that Liverpool and City didn't show that <laughs> if they both had 28 games. <laughs> All right. I know that's a big, important part of the show that's worthy of um, right, I'm going to just ignore. Is that is that the wrong table? Oh, for fuck's sake, who cares? Uh, who cares? Right. I think I'm frustrated this morning. You can tell I'm frustrated this morning. Anyway, my point here. <sighs> I'm just I'm bored of United being crap, man. Yeah. <sighs> I'm bored of watching Liverpool and City and Arsenal being involved in a title race. I'm bored of, as I said, like um, just arguing among United fans. And all yesterday, right, all yesterday, all I saw all over Twitter, everywhere, was just this conversation about that Rasmus Hoyland interview. And a little comment from the UWS mag in the gutter snipe section. I actually haven't got my copy yet. Maybe I need to check the letterbox. And Goldbridge getting absolutely slated. And it's just... It, like the United fan base is just... Um, you, you can't... You can't... Um, Like you're not allowed an argument. If if you say one thing, then somebody's going to say, "Well, what about this?" It, there's there's so much what aboutery. You have to, and I'm telling you, like, B 
because I, I'm, I'm so involved in it on a day-to-day -day basis, right? This is my job. It's a massive part of my life. I wake up, seven in the morning, I'm there doing research for an hour, hour and a half, looking at all the stories, seeing what's being said amongst the United fan base, checking everything, bringing it all together for a live show in the morning. And I can just see that. The, and, I've, and I've said this so many times before, right? The thing that frustrates me the most is that for so many fans, you have to live in the extremes. You have to, I told you this, you have to be Ten Hag in. You have to be Ten Hag out. You have to be, um, this player has to be sold. You have to be so definitive and so extreme because there's, because the internet has given a voice to everybody. The reason I, I, I exist here with us, with this community, is because the internet has given me the opportunity to. It's also given the opportunity for a lot of idiots to get a voice. And I'm not here shouting that Goldberg is an idiot, right? I disagree with a fair amount of what he does. I disagree with the the nature of so many of the... There was a, a there was a show they did over the weekend when it was like there was at least a deal done on the on the on the thumbnail. I'm like, what? How? H how on earth have you run with that as a thumbnail? Because it's going to get you to click. Because it's going to bring you in. And that angers me because it goes completely against what I do here, and is a massive reason. Why United People's TV will never get that sort of exposure, never. But it's just it, it, this is what you this is what you're you're up against and what you're running against, and it's just it's that's why it's frustrating when I'm trying to operate in a specific style, and it and it just and you see that shit and it goes against it, and it, that that's what annoys me. I don't really care about anything else they do, but yeah, it's just like the United fan base, man. I'm sure it's the same in other one in other clubs. But I don't really care about other clubs. It's just, um, it's just fr frustrating. And you know what? I'm really frustrated right now because I'm like, I'm about, I saw those, what was it, like four weeks since I've had the surgery? You try not walking, no weight bearing for six weeks and see how frustrated you get. <laughs> I only slept for an hour the other night. It's this, um, <laughs> I've come here with like a Monday, a Monday hood up vibe, I think. <sighs> It's going to be nice when United aren't crap. And it, it is a case of when and not if, all right? It is a case of when and not if. Steve, I can just see you just gifted five memberships there, dude. I hope the button's working. Didn't actually test this before. One second here. The button works. Come on. But yeah, to, to it annoys me so much because I've worked to sort of try and keep on a level playing field to... Integrity is important to me. It really is. I, I, I went to Anfield the other week. I've always wanted to go to Anfield. I never got a ticket in the, in the ballot ever. Finally got one. And I walked in there and I'm in the Anfield away end. And there's a couple of people reaching over saying, Sam, how you doing, man? Nice to see you. Nice to meet you. And I can do that in an away end. When I went to the protest, I don't get to go to games much anymore. All right. Truth be told, it's kind of the irony of, of this whole thing. I've built this community and now this is where my my match day experience lies because I'm part of your match day experience. I went to the protest before the Liverpool game. Actually took Susie, my partner. First time that she had been to United game. Talk about baptism for five. Didn't exactly, uh, <laughs> didn't exactly give her the best intro. I know, to be fair, it was the best intro actually, but it was a tough intro. Went to the protest before the Liverpool game. 10,000 people marching, organised by the 1958. And inside that, I've told you this before, inside that crowd there was a dude top off, tatted, from like head to toe, <laughs> maybe not head to toe, whole chest, head, madness, came over to me and said, Sam, love United People's TV, love what you do. And then there was a family who came along, two young kids came over and talked to me. Um, it just annoys me, all right? It really, it, it really annoys me because I, I try everything to do something a certain way and something does, some, does it so differently, but they'll get more exposure they'll get bigger audiences because that's how the internet works because you have to live in the extremes. And if you don't live in the extreme, people are just going to watch somebody else that does live in the extreme. 
And that's how it works. And that's what's frustrating. <sighs> oh, my God. Wow. Am I, I think I'm reading that right, man. Claus, you've just gifted 10 memberships. Santa, indeed. Can I say thank I you very that. much, I dude? Can't believe, can't believe it. I still haven't updated these. It's because right now, the reason, can I, can I tell you why I haven't updated these? It's because when I'm finished with all the lunchtime videos, I go and put my leg up in the air because it starts throbbing. Um, and I need to do all this on this computer right now, so I'm not actually here too much. But Akash, man. Thank you, man. Thank you so much. Five, Hit the lights. Four, Turn them all three, off. Does it work? One. By the way, big up to Oppenheimer. <laughs> Just saying that because the bomb went off. <laughs> Oppenheimer cleaning up at the awards. Oscars. Awards? Oscars? Same thing. Yeah, man. Bring it out. And... And you just sent a lovely super chat there, and it's um. Can I just read this out? And it's you're doing serious journalism in a world of sensationalism and instant gratification, Sam. <laughs> just like pissing in the wind, you get wet legs. Now, I do love this community, man. I disagree with a, a, a lot of how United Stand act, all right, and what they do, and it's the complete opposite of how I present myself. And it's because I don't know. I'll always do things differently. That's why United People's TV is different, all right? And always will be. We might be smaller, size and everything, all right? <laughs> yeah, Oppenheimer was a class film. All right, I need, to, I need to watch it again. Maybe not soon. You know what I need to watch actually first before that? I need to watch Tenet again. I watched Tenet once. I went to the cinema and I left with a legitimate headache. And that, it was just, there was so much noise in that film. <sighs> Yeah, thank you very much, ladies and gents. That was a bit of a sort of a rant this morning. A bit of a incoherent rant, I suppose. It's just when, when, when you put so much effort and time into it and you do it a specific way that you know is the correct way to do it and then you see something else and you go, well, I mean, I know it would have got more attention, but really? I think it creates a community which has long uh, longevity in it and we can do things better and we keep going. Tenet, yeah, I need to watch Tenet again. Let's speak about, look, let's get into the news, all right? There's lots of news to speak through. Uh, I'm going to speak about uh, Andy Burnham on the Old Trafford redevelopment. That is such a ridiculously exciting concept. I still don't know which, I still don't know what part of me is, uh, as, as a percentage, whether I want, actually, no, that's a complete lie. I know exactly what I want. I would love Old Trafford to be rebuilt, but I think I've got the awareness that a lot of United fans don't. That it's just, it's it feels unfeasible for that to become the stadium that we want it to be. But anyway, let's run through the game against Everton before I then go and have this conversation around the stadium, all right? And can I say Akash there one more time? I kind of brushed over that. You just gifted 50 memberships, dude. It honestly is the most generous thing that anybody can do in this community. And they all go to inviting all of you into United People's TV. That's the link to the Discord. Come in there. Come into there. Come into the... Now that you've uh, just been gifted a membership, you can come into the members chat. All you've got to do is join Discord and link your YouTube account to your Discord. There's mods in there. It's only a five-minute process. Then you come into the members chat. All right? Let's talk about the game against Everton. All right? Thumbs up. All right? Three points. Come on. That's a... Pfft. Someone give me some positives from that game. Actually, there, 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 there are a couple, all right? There's certainly one. Alejandro Garnacho was the difference maker. The absolute difference maker in that game. In a game which just... I mean, from both teams, let's be completely honest. Both teams massively devoid of any quality that did not look if it compare those two games right united against everton and liverpool against city when it comes to levels and it's boy oh boy like it was not premier it was not a premier league game of football nuruddin my man by the way i think you said the other day the other week that your surgery was cancelled don't know if that's a good or a bad thing 
but nice to see you here this morning. I see everyone everyone tuning in. Jared Branthwaite was class, Alex. It's a, it's a good point down there. I don't think Onana did too much. Well, Amadou. Um, but I enjoyed watching Branthwaite. I'm really interested to see what United do. Going to do a little video this week, a little short video on sort of probably a keep or sell on centre-backs. I might do a keep or... I think I've already done a... Well, you know the players I think we should be building around overall. Anyway, that'll be, on, that'll be a short video. But Garnacho winning both penalties. And both of them were stonewall penalties, by the way. There's no arguments. There's been There's been a mad reaction. Just angry Evertonians, I think, at uh, Garnacho celebrating the fact that he got a penalty. Oh, I hate the way that modern football's gone. I mean, that has been part of football forever. Overreacting. Play acting. <laughs> Way before VAR. That was just an old school um, argument. Garnacho was really the real, real deal. Now, Andy Mitten's actually released a, a nice long article here on Garnacho. The rise of Manchester United's electric entertainer. And I'm looking forward to reading that. Haven't actually um haven't actually read it fully yet. So I'm not going to run through it. But I think it's a very fair way to describe him as an electric entertainer because he Garnacho is the sort of player, and these are these are definitely my favourite United players. Those players that make you shuffle to the front of your seat when you're watching it. Those players that make the stadium stand up as soon as he goes towards the, the final third with the ball at his feet. They're the most exciting players. They are the ones that are the difference makers. Matt, nice to see you there, dude. You gifted five memberships as well. What a show this morning, man. <sighs> really is um quite rewarding, I think. Every time I come on here and just have a little chat, say kind of say what I'm thinking and how the community reacts and responds, and you all get involved, it's um yeah, it is really rewarding, massively. Kind of it, it goes to show that I, I I'm correct to stick to my guns. Nuruddin, you just fifty five again, man. This gong is getting an absolute pelt in today. You all, you all show me that I'm right to stick to my guns, and that in the long term, we'll come out on top but it's just it's a frustrating journey sometimes it really is um speaking of frustrating hmm. and people think that i've got some sort of they, they love, the, love the word agenda don't they <laughs> if there's a bit of news that somebody doesn't like it's pr spin if there's a, an opinion that somebody doesn't like it's an agenda that's what I mean. Look, we're living in the worlds of extremes. No, no, my friend, it's it's just it, it's it's just a piece of news that you don't like. No, it's a PR spin. <laughs> okay, <laughs> okie dokie, you can do that. Like, is this an opinion? You don't know. It's a complete agenda against that player. No, no, it's it, it's just it's just an opinion you, you don't like. It's not an agenda. I don't want to have a poor opinion of Casemiro. I mean, I loved him last season. I always stand by the fact it was an outrageously poor signing in the long term. Because a year and a bit down the line, like the conversations we're having about Casemiro, man, and the performance of Casemiro, and just the... Man, somebody in the comments, please help me. Help me understand what is going on with Casemiro. I know the system hasn't helped him this season. I don't think the system, uh, I don't think, well, we were kind of defending in a bit of a low block. There wasn't a huge amount of spaces. We weren't going really aggressive with the front press that we were at the start of the season like against Wolves. But it's just like Paul Scholes on Instagram, right? Said this. Have you ever seen a, a, a team give the ball away as much in your life? And it's... um. Richard, you're saying, look, Casemiro's in his 30s. I, I'm going to go down here, right? I'm going to read some of your comments out on Casemiro. We are not the team we were this season, but it's almost like his head has gone, says Ant. Casemiro's in his 30s, terrified of refs and red cards. Uh, he's playing with Bruno. That's the problem. That's an interesting take. Um, pace of the game, too much. Room. No, but the, the, the biggest issues that I saw from Casemiro against um, Everton... I had nothing to do with the pace of the game, man. 
It was like he just had the ball at his feet. Wrong pass. Wrong position. Just wrong everything. Like all small things. And something that Casemiro does, and it, uh, this has to be an instruction from Eric Ten Hag, because he's done it so often this season. And when he's good, he's very good at it. But Casemiro does that like whip. Pogba used to do this pass. You know the pass where you don't really look where it's going. You just know that if you whip a ball as a central midfielder over the top into a certain area without looking, you're, you're hoping that your players should be in those positions. And Casemiro does a lot of that. Does that a lot? Just receives the ball. He's like the opposite player. And, th and this is, I think, what I would probably say is frustrating me from an Eric Ten Hag perspective, right? Have you ever seen a team give away the... No, I don't think you have. And right now, okay, let's bring this up. Should probably have got this photo up. I've completely... I just... I didn't think about it. But let's bring this here, right? We speak about the fact that this team simply put, is just not holding on to the ball enough and hasn't been holding on to the ball enough all season. Uh, Paul Scholes is here saying that, look, have you ever seen a team give away the ball more? No. But United have got two midfielders who are going to give you a bit of a solution to that. Now, people are going to come at me saying, oh, Amrabat's too slow, this, too slow. There is, I don't think there's an element of Casemiro's game right now that would tell me that from a form perspective, he would be a better choice to start than Amrabat, other than the intangibles that we can't see, the leadership behind the scenes. Eric Ten Hag said that he trains, one, he's one of the best players in training. Um, and he's got experience, and he's got leadership, he's got all of that. Yeah, I know he does. But I would much rather see Amrabat in that position just uh, just now, right? J just, just on form. I, I, I really try to focus on playing players on form. And Mainu is somebody who he's so good. I don't I personally don't want um Kobe Mainu to be that first phase midfielder. I would much rather he be the hybrid, the one that's in between the number six and the number eight position. That link between the deeper number six and the more aggressive number eight, who's Bruno Fernandez. Keep Bruno Fernandez in the opposition's half. Like again, like, people sit I don't get it. And this argument with a few mates on WhatsApp over the weekend. I'm like, how do, how on earth do you have so much energy to argue again about Bruno Fernandez's problems when there are so many other issues I'd fix at this football club first? And Simi Skim, you're you're sitting there, you're gunning for Bruno down there. Like, I I I don't get it. I really don't understand it from United fans. Like, we have so many problems, and you're looking at taking out the most creative player that we've got in this team one of the most creative players that has existed in the Premier League over the last five years. Like the numbers do not lie. You have to build a midfield around that. You have to <laughs> build a solid midfield behind Bruno. Not take him out and put someone else in. Matt, is, I don't get it. It's honestly the weirdest argument, I think, that any United fan can have. I don't know how people have got energy for it. But here, right... Like someone down there is disagreeing with saying we need Kobe Manu as that deeper number six. We don't have anybody else. Maybe in the shorter term for the rest of the season, maybe that could be an opportunity. But that is a profile that we still don't have at this club. Amrabat, if he had the athleticism of Manu, might be a package. But he's not the package, is he? But right now, Casemiro is hurting us. No agenda. Fans turning on our best players when they have a dip in form in worrying is worrying, says Lee. Lee, my friend, there's a dip in form. Then there's August, September, October, November, December, January, February, March, eight months of an entire season. And we're having conversations here about the like the utter basics. We're not really talking about fitness levels. We're not talking about returning from injury. We're just talking about a man who just I don't get it. I, 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 the, the Casemiro situation I find very baffling. I think tactically he wasn't being helped by the setup early this season, but it's just, it's, it's bonkers. And if we're going to try and keep this ball more, and we, we, I'm not even sure that we that Eric Ten Hag wants to at this stage. 
I think we I think we want um I think we want possession more than Eric Ten Hag wants possession. It's, it's crazy. I'm glad to hear read a few of your comments. Um, I'd like, oh, nice little bit of what, little bit of what about down there in the comments. You don't talk this much about Rashford or McTominay. <laughs> Spot the person who hasn't been here as part of United People's TV this season. Bingo, bango. <laughs> Man, the amount of grief I gave uh, McTominay. Woo. Uh, Michael saying, which position is best for Casemiro in, in midfield? Like, dude, I was. I was hoping so much. I was like, let's just get this midfield of Casemiro, Manu, and Bruno. And we finally got it. And then look at this. It's um the majority of Manchester. Say I don't know what I, I still don't know what to put it down as a percentage. All right. And again, this is what people do. You're either against the players, you're either against Ten Hag. Or maybe, maybe there's problems in both. Maybe, you know, it's a little bit of both. Man United set up, out of possession, in possession, tactically. It's been poor all season. And a midfield trio, which I've been asking for, I think has played everything in the last five games. And we are just conceding shot after shot after shot after shot. And against Everton, uh, the reason that we didn't concede, I'm going to speak about Andrew and Nana next, but our box defending was very good. Varane. And Evans. Really quite good. Very good, in fact. Nice blocks. That's why we didn't concede. And if we're going into this Liverpool game this weekend, look, when we were playing away at Liverpool, I think that might have been one of the first games where... That was... Well, we got the draw. And we were, I think we conceded like 30 shots. But I was there. I was stood behind the goal. And there was only a couple of shots from Liverpool that ever really genuinely threatened our goal. But 467 shots conceded. Only Sheffield United, who are rock bottom. Are they rock bottom? Or Burnley are? I don't know. Anyway, bottom two. I can see quite a few of you down there speaking about this man. And my man crush, it started last season. And it's continued this season. So all of the evening, Casemiro goal versus Liverpool. And you'll all remember he remember he's a GOAT. I don't want my defensive midfielder to be scoring goals. I want my defensive midfielder to make absolutely certain that my defence is protected. I want him to be the bouncer of the team. Not the star of the show. Sprinkling a little goal on top, great. But that's not the main priority of my defensive midfielder. And we're talking about the mentality of of Martinez, man. That's, uh, you know what? Subconsciously, I think that's probably part of the reason why the man crush was so, <laughs> was and is so big. We simply are, I think I've used this analogy before, but it's correct. If you're in an office environment, right? And your boss goes out of the office, goes out for an hour. Productivity goes down, whispers can start, you start playing games, start having little chats. Just take it easy. Boss isn't here. Ah, that's all right, we'll get back to it as soon as he comes back. Boss comes back in, all facing there, typing it. How you doing? Yeah, yeah, yeah. Okay. Crack on, right? Because you can't get away with it when the boss is there. That's kind of what it feels like Manchester United are when Martinez is and isn't in the team. Because when he is in the team, everybody else feels a sort of responsibility, not responsibility, but an obligation to not piss about. Martinez has that sort of infectious attitude that really rubs off on everybody in the right way. And when he's not there, it just it just isn't there. Man, Giggs was pulling... Shame Giggs is such an arsehole. Great footballer. I, watched, I was watching a video the other day of... Um, I think it was him against Real Madrid and he was like 39. Vijay, we need a ball carry this, we need a ball carry that. Like, truth be told, like, no. I think Casemiro starts against Liverpool. Uh, if, I just, I don't understand how he's, the, the drop-off is so severe. 
I don't, I don't think it's fair to simply say, oh, that's just down to tactics. That's just down to coaching. That's the reason for it. That, go, that only goes so far. I, I think it's just, he's lost something else as well. I don't know whether it's a, it's a desire to be here. I don't, know whether, I don't know what it is. I don't know, but something just isn't quite right with Casemiro. And I think that you can't just put down two tactics. Now, somebody who is performing and, and is um, improving, Game on game. Andrea Nanaman. Again, a player who so many fans wanted, booted out of our football club after a month and a half because you didn't give it to me straight away and I will not support you unless you give it to me straight away. Get out of the club, sign another player. Get rid. Instant gratification. Andrew Anand Anana did not give us instant gratification. Nuruddin is saying Sam is leech out for the season. I, I don't think he's out for the season season, but by the time he comes back, I'd be surprised. Oh, well, I suppose we'll never know, right? It depends how good we play and, and how Vitter and Spurs play. But I don't really think he's going to come back and have any sort of impact on this season. I might be wrong. But oh, Anana, right? So happy for him, man. Really am. Um, the way... I, I would love for... I don't know. How, how cool would that be as a deep dive? Oh, actually, I can't really do it as a deep dive. I would love to just honestly speak to some players. and like, How much pressure do you feel when you play for Manchester United? Because it must be sort of hard to describe, like the weight of wearing the United shirt. Like Onana was, and this is the thing that didn't make sense to me, right? Onana was like a brash goalkeeper. He was a goalkeeper that like played with swagger. Uh, just he would do a drag back. He, we were we were worried he was we were worried about the Bartes moments. You remember Bartes? Right? strolling out for his box, rolling it out, just jogging out, saying, mate, what are you doing? Just pass to someone else. They're the sorts of um, problems we thought we were going to have with Onana. And then it just ended up being like a huge focus on his shot stopping and a huge focus on like, my God, man. How many mistakes can you make? Like, mis like lapses of concentration mistakes. But the way that he has responded post the African Cup of Nations, really good, man. And there was one point in the second minute against Everton, I believe, when there was a cross that came over. I don't know how we defended it so poorly. I think it just bounced off. And then he came steaming out, dived at the feet. I think it was of Onana or was it Dakura? I think it was Onana. And just, just got the ball. Just went for it. A couple of times he's parrying balls, he's parrying crosses. He's looking far more commanding than he has, that. well, than he did before the start of the season, and I've and I and I've not 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 for the start of the season than he did in the first half of this season, and I've said this before. I said, like, put Edison, put Allison, put David Raya in that team that concedes four hundred and sixty-seven shots, and you show me how many clean sheets they're going to keep. You show me how much that goalkeeper is going to be able to focus on the greatest strength that he has natural strength, which is his ability with the ball at his feet to be the playmaker from deep. That's why we signed Onana. And we've hardly seen it because Ten Hag has drifted massively from that. Dave, the alleged. Thank you very much, dude. Jonathan, you'll be gifted a membership. Esterick, uh, Kasten and Nicholas. Everyone say thank you there to Dave. Big up, Dave. Um, if we're going to get a result, and I've been, I said this against City. I said, we're going to get a result against City. Right now, our goalkeeper, our goalkeeper, if we're going to get a result with any game, has to have a stormer. That's how many shots we're conceding. United, I'll be amazed if we can get a win between now and the end of the season with one goal. And it, oh, that's, that annoyed me so much against Everton. I'm like, please get the third goal. Please get the third goal. Please get the third goal. And we never did. And the, the entire time, we knew that if Everton scored one, 
That would happen. You knew that would happen. <sighs> frustrating, frustrating, frustrating. But anyway, Onana playing as well as he's playing. Big up to him. I don't know why that's a bit weird. The ch the font for the um, the legend has just completely changed. <laughs> I've no idea. Why on earth has that happened? There's a little button up there. Latest member. Odd. Very, very odd. Uh, what's the next talking point here? Oh, yeah. Quite have a little conversation about these two bad boys. I could, I, I could throw a picture of um, Rafa Varane up there as well. Like, we have been bad this season. Todd knows where, how much further we would have fallen if Johnny Evans didn't end up being the player that he's been, that he's been this season. Sam Ford, Sam wants the manager out. <laughs> Okie dokie. Uh, sometimes I do nibble on frauds. Frauds? Trolls. And frauds, probably. Sometimes it's fun, too. Sometimes it just gets under my skin. But um, Johnny Evans and Rafa Varane, as I said, with this, with this box, we, we, we've become a box-defending team. And by that, it, I mean that it, from a tactic perspective, we are happy to give up a lot of the pitch and just defend in our own box. Last ditch defend, defend if you want to call it that, blocks, tackles, right? Evans has been fantastic. I think I said this, um, I've said it a while ago. Well, I said it a while ago, probably quite recently, actually. I honestly think the way that it's going, the way that I think it will go with Varane, and maybe with Maguire too, and potentially Lindelof, I do really feel that Johnny Evans is probably going to get one more year and that next season will end up being how we thought Johnny Evans would be this season. Randomly popping in to play a game here or there and go, oh, it's Johnny Evans, he's still class. Instead of every single bloody week, Johnny Evans playing. That's what I think will happen. And I think he's actually, I think he's earned it, if I'm being completely honest. Um... And you're saying that I feel for Onana. It's like he's going for a degree. He's got, he's got ace every exam. It's not just a spotlight of being a Manchester United goalkeeper. It's a spotlight of being a Premier League goalkeeper. Go and ask Aaron Ramsdale. And nobody was nobody really speaks about goalkeeper. Like, have you seen anything in the press this week about? Or in the last few weeks about Andre Onana, they were absolutely ripping him to shreds when he was making mistakes that cost us the Champions League. And there's not a peep at any point since AFCON about his form and how he's, you know, just delivering really as a goalkeeper. And again, we're living in the world of extremes. The only time you'll ever talk about a goalkeeper is if he makes a mistake that can leads to a goal that you concede and then you lose a game, or if he Saves a penalty and has another world-class save. That you will only speak about the extremes in the media. That's why we, as a community, we can speak about these things that kind of otherwise wouldn't be spoken about. That's why I think, anyway. If I can ask you here, ladies and gents, before we move on to speak about the triple injury boost and then we speak about the stadium, can you please drop a like on the video? And if you are new, please do subscribe to United People's TV. Make a big, big difference. This could be big, right? Obviously, I'm not going to be previewing the Liverpool game until later in the week. There's other conversations that we can have in the next few days before we move on to that. And injuries have just plagued us all season, all right? They really have. And truth be told, it's pretty awful how big the drop-off has been. Now, the injuries have been like substantial and continuous. But I do wish that United didn't have such a severe drop-off. It just goes to show that 18 months into Ten Hag's reign, uh, he's not been able to get that sort of impact that goes past the starting 11 just yet. And we wasted some money for sure. 100% we've wasted money. But this is the good news, all right? Hopefully some players will return. This is what Eric Ten Hag said after the Everton game. Aaron Wan-Bissaka was yesterday on the pitch. We also ex we expect also that Harry Maguire will be back in the squad next week. And Rasmus Hoyland has a good hope he will make it as well. Right? 
So that could be a proper triple injury boost because if Aaron wan it's probably Aaron wan and Rasmus Horden are the two biggest ones, right? wan coming in and being fit. He'll go play right back and we'll play Diogo Delo left back. And again, if we're talking about players this season, Diogo Delo really has been like a 7 out of 10 like pretty much most weeks. No one's really said anything about him. Again, we only live in the world of extremes. We will only speak about a player if he puts in a shocker of a performance or if he puts in a blinding 30 yard goal performance. Whereas Diogo Delo has just been doing his job pretty much all season. Wambasaka could play left back. What game was it where Wambasaka played left back? I was like, eh? I think it's because it was a late fitness thing and they worked on the patterns all week. And then I think Diogo Delo ended up staying uh, right back. I think so. I personally would, I'm guessing Salah is going to be fit to play against United. I think he came off the bench against City, but I think he'll be fit. So I want Delo down there against Salah. Uh, people gassing Delo up too much recently. Dude, he probably has been. But he's, it's now suddenly he's our player of the season. He's been consistently okay. He mate, you, Right there, he has been consistently okay. Consistently good. Honestly, he's pretty much been like a 7 out of 10 all season. And in a season of just ridiculous inconsistencies, that stands out for a good reason. But Hoyland coming back. Man. <laughs> think, think about the... the the peaks and the troughs of Hoyland's season, man. Like not not scoring in fourteen Premier League games, but then scoring five goals and being the top goal scorer of the Champions League group stage, and in and out, and then scoring that goal against Villa, and then going on such a great run, and then getting injured, and now disappearing, and then United can't score for Toffee since. We need Hoyland back. Without Hoyland, the front press is non-existent. Without Hoyland, the shape up front is non-existent. Rashford can't play through the middle, ever. I think Bruno was basically like a false nine against um, Everton at the weekend. I personally would rather it have been switched and McTominay players, and I've said this so many bloody times, it hurts. I'd rather McTominay be that false nine. Don't go for any sort of front press. Don't be crazy. We can't do that. Just let McTominay go up there, come down to the mid block because then Bruno will receive the ball in better positions rather than McTominay. I think McTominay against Everton because of the positions on the pitch, and Bruno was playing slightly further up sometimes, he ended up receiving the ball like three or four times. There was one really good pass he did through to Garnacho, and one really nice ball over the top, I think, to Rashford. But there were two or three, at least other occasions, where if McTominay had the ability of Bruno with the ball at his feet, we would have been put straight through. But that's where I, I want Bruno to receive the ball. A bit weird that he I don't know, just ended up being the wrong way around quite a few times between McTominay and Bruno. Hoyland? I don't think, well, I suppose it depends whether he's fit or not, right? Because after the Liverpool game, we've got a break. Literally the international break. I think our game, next game after that, is it... Mm, is it Brentford? I think it might be Brentford. Let's have a look. It's Brentford. So we play Liverpool on the 17th, and then 13 days later, Saturday 8... Uh, Saturday 8 p.m. kickoff. Ugh, that's Saturday night ruined. Oh, no, maybe made. But 13 days between the Liverpool game and the Brentford game. So as long as he's fit, as long as he's fit, I would definitely start him. This game against Liverpool, type this in the comments. If you're, if you're on YouTube or Facebook, type this in the comments. I, I want to know if what people think. Do, would you say that the season is over if we lose to Liverpool? Type yes or no. I don't think I go as far as to say that the season would be over if we lose to Liverpool, but we would be like basically like holding on to the coattails of of like a tiny sliver of a top four chance. And I think I personally think that Eric Ten Hag will. I think he would struggle from a motivational perspective 
with these players if we like get trounced and we get and we get knocked out of the FA Cup. I think I think for him as a manager to be able to g these players up, I really think we need the adrenaline hit of beating Liverpool, of taking the FA Cup away from them in Klopp's last season. And I think if we lose against Liverpool, I think he's I think it's going to be it's going to be tough. I I wouldn't go as far as to say the season is going to be over. But I think from a managerial mot- motivational perspective, lose to Liverpool, it's going to be hard to get these players motivated. And this Liverpool team right now, um, they are they are riding. Look, Klopp is a it, Klopp is a great manager. I'm delighted he's leaving. All right, he gets far more out of these players than he should be able to get out of these players, and that's what the greatest managers do. And that's what frustrates a lot of United fans. They see what Eric Ten Hag has, has done and all the injuries we've had. And they look at Liverpool and go, well, they didn't have Salah or Trent against City and they've managed to dominate them. But there is that eight years into that project. Uh, and this is the the long goodbye. So they've got they've got more. But if we do not like if if we play how we played, right? Again, is that a photo there? Oh, look at that. If we play how we played there against Everton and we do that against Liverpool in this season for Liverpool, in their last game at Old Trafford under Klopp, Liverpool, they're going to shred us. Well, actually not last game because we played them in the league as well. But they are going to shred us. We won't be able to do that box defending against Liverpool. So how does it? How do we change that? How do we switch that? I don't quite know. I'll be honest... And I'm quite scared. Don't know why I went into Scottish accent for that. Uh, but yeah, I'm I'm nay looking forward to that game. I don't think many many United fans are. Boy. Anyway, let's speak about that a little bit later in the week. I want to speak about this because this really is um, this is the this is the big project. This is the biggest project. I, I, project might be the right wrong way to describe it and you're saying I, I can accept losing but it's how that matters I mean I can't accept losing sod that man just just dick him just stamp just stamp on him please we've got two opportunities here to just put a stake in it not a ribeye right through the heart of Liverpool's long goodbye for Klopp. Can we please get a last laugh? All right? Because they have been slapping us up silly for so many years. All right? Just, just don't. <laughs> just don't. <laughs> but, um, right, we'll speak about that later in the week. Andy Burnham, Mayor of Greater Manchester speaking about the public money. Now, this has been this has been like a slightly strange thing that's happened. There's been a massive amount of outcry. I want to pull this interview up here. This is on Sky Sports News. And this is Andy Burnham speaking about the project, right? And I'm going to play this and then we'll have a little chat. All right. One second there. Let me play it. So I think in either option, uh, either refurbished ground or or new uh, stadium close by there will be implications for the transport system. So I need to show the club what might be possible, what the pros and cons are of each of each approach. So it has to be a public-private partnership. You know, this idea that it's all about throwing public money into a stadium, it's, it, it's got to be a partnership, as every other uh, stadium project has been. If you look at Everton at Bramley Moor, Liverpool City region have put in the enabling works around, around the new stadium. It's the, it's the same with us. But, you know, for me, it's about capturing those, capturing those benefits. What I've got to do as part of the task force is get to the middle of this year or later this year, allow the club to have all of the information, the, the, you know, the pros and the cons of the different options so that it can make a, a fully informed decision. And that's what we'll do. People are getting really pissed off. Well, they're, they're just trying to anyway. The idea that there's going to be any sort of public money involved in this. But... Ian, you, you, you're down there. You're saying that you're a senior project manager. This is a major program of works. It, it really is. It's, it, is a, it is potentially a complete regeneration of that part of Manchester. 
that will create thousands of homes, maybe thousands of new jobs, new, just everything that doesn't just benefit Manchester United. You know, in the same way that um, the London, and that, that's why, so I did the video, when did, I, when did that video come out? I think that was Friday evening, wasn't it? Uh, one second, it is on this one. It was on Friday night, so we've not actually had the chance to speak about this yet. Let's have a little quick five-minute chat. Manchester United announcing that the um, task force... Now, Habib, obviously you've not been part of United People's TV at any point. Have you been to Old Trafford before? Yes, I've got a season ticket. Yes, I love Old Trafford. I'll speak about that sep separately later, but... That task force with Seb Coe at the top of it, obviously, who was in charge of leading the organisation of the London Olympics. I think that's a smart call from Ratcliffe, if I'm honest. Experienced, knows what he's talking about. They've got the Andy Burnham is way on board and helping because Manchester as a city will hugely benefit from this whole regeneration project. Turning like industrial land into residential and business space that's used to generate an area of new tourism of new of a new economy it's all going to massively benefit the city of manchester hence why andy burnham will absolutely be supporting everything that ratcliffe is doing i think he's just assembled a good team here i think gary never being involved and i think if i'm correct there's nobody directly involved from manchester united in that and you know what's an interesting part of this is we've been we've been told that there's going to be a decision on this at the tail end of 2024. So maybe in six months' time, and this the, the key word here is feasibility. That is what is going to be found, all right? Is it possible, logistically, financially, socially, is it possible that Old Trafford can be expanded? And, and, I've, and, and I've been thinking about this over the weekend, right? I'm curious as to know what your comment is here, right? How, as a minimum, don't just go crazy, right? Don't just throw like a 130,000 capacity at me. Capacity at Old Trafford right now is what? 75,000? Old Trafford capacity. 74,310 apparently. Well, there you go. What would you say is the minimum capacity that you want for the new stadium? Whether that is a regenerated Old Trafford. Whether that is a brand new stadium. What do you think it needs to be? To be this Wembley of the North, to use Ratcliffe's phrase. Because for all this upheaval that is going to come, and there is, I mean, there's some, there's some big upheaval coming, peeps. We don't know whether we're going to have a stadium to play in, depending on whether or not we go down the regeneration or well, redevelopment of Old Trafford route. But if it's 70, 74,310 right now, what do you think it needs to be as a minimum? I'm going to go read your comments. Stevie saying, I can get on board with a new stadium, but I need to know the plan for Old Trafford first. I mean, I'm going to presume that if we do get a new stadium, that's going to be Old Trafford will be probably downsized somewhat. Maybe keep the pitch, maybe keep slumps part of the structure. No, I don't know. Maybe just keep the whole structure. I don't know. It'd be a bit weird to play it in. And then use it as an academy and a, and for the women's teams, as well, for the women's game as well. I don't know. Um, 90K says Ross and Kieran and Sean and Akash and Steve. Uh, you all say 90. Matt, you're saying 95. Alex, you're saying 80,000 as a minimum. I would disagree with that. I think if Manchester United did all of this and we ended up with a stadium that has 80,000, I think that would be a massive, a massive disappointment. I personally think we should be, it might sound silly. I don't, I don't know whether it sounds silly or not. I think we should be aiming for what 
One second there. I don't know why I'm being dramatic about this. Right there. That should be the capacity of Manchester United's new stadium. All right. That would be a third increase, a 33% increase on where we're at right now. 75,000. That right there is, um, it, it just, it feels appropriate. Again, from a feasibility perspective, this might just not be possible. Now, if we're talking about 100,000, that rules out any sort of Old Trafford redevelopment, in my opinion. How on earth, how, how in the world are you going to get another 25,000 seats in that stadium? I know that there is a possibility that we can build over the railway now and increase. That's a, that's a lot. I think this is where we should be aiming. I don't know whether that's possible, all right? But if we are going to go down that path, then make it happen. I don't know. Ross, you're saying we need the Bernabeu style stadium. The capacity is only 83, but if you look at where the Bernabeu is, it's, it's, whoosh, it's slap bang in the middle of Madrid, man. Like There's not much space either side. You look at where United can potentially be doing this and building this, it's in all the land that we own around Old Trafford. The footprint will be pretty much as big as we want the footprint to be. I, w I would love for that to be where United aim. 100,000. I don't know whether that's possible, but at the absolute minimum, absolute minimum it has to be 90,000. Anything less than 90,000 would be a disappointment. A massive disappointment. Given how long we've waited for a re any sort of regeneration of our stadium. Minimum 90. I would love for United to aim for the 100,000. And as Andy Burnham says there, people are going to try and get offended by this. But if Man United go down the new stadium route and it's part of a massive Trafford Council regeneration of Manchester project with five districts in which one of which would be the regeneration of Old Trafford, then there should be some public money that goes towards that as part of the overall big picture, which some people don't want to see. But then if you go down and you look at the, um, you look at, uh, what's it called? Damn it. Westfield. You look at Westfield down there in Stratford, you look at uh, the London Stadium, you look at that entire project and you look at what was there before to what is there now. You created a massive, massive new, I don't know what to call it, new mini town, I suppose. That otherwise, I can't remember, what was there before? Was it just derelict land? I can't remember. But I think that project is going to be an interesting comparison that would draw into um, what happens with Old Trafford. I'm going to read some of your comments out down here. Uh, Aiden saying 100k, but we need a proper fan section. It's too quiet. Uh, well, we're, we're not going to argue about stadium atmosphere at this point. That you're, that you're going down into the details. At this, we're, we're talking about the grander, the grander project here. Sean, I think it has to be minimum 90k if you want to break even faster. Of course... And this is a huge thing, man. Like, when it comes to the stadium, how it's paid for and who pays for it is a big, big thing. It's a massive, massive um, question. Alex, you're saying it was Brownfield land there in, um, where the London Stadium got built on. Must be a safe standing area. Akash, you're saying more debt. Well, there will be more debt. Right? I, I don't want to come here sort of using the... <laughs> the big D word. <laughs> but there will be more debt from this stadium. All right. It's how that debt is serviced, which will be one of the biggest uh, sticking points for Ineos. Because that debt cannot be serviced by Manchester United. Now, Man United will actually benefit from this new stadium. So it's not as if we're just paying back the owner's debt of the loan that they bought our club with and we're not gaining from it. Manchester United would ultimately gain from the debt of, that's a, that's a weird thing to say, would ultimately gain from the new stadium. So we'd be building an asset for our football club that we owned. So it is a different type of debt, but ultimately the debt is not something that we want on our club. So how are Ineos going to do that? It's a big, big thing. All right. 
Probably one of the biggest questions, biggest concerns I think a lot of you have got. Wow, that is a long old show we've had this morning. An hour and five minutes. Damn. Monday. Monday's always busy. And I just like chatting to you sometimes. Only sometimes. Wait. Two days until my birthday. What am I going to get? Nothing. Can't even walk. Bar humbug. Um, my lunchtime video today... I don't know what I'm going to do it on. I kind of feel like I want to articulate... You know what I was speaking about at the start of the show? About the United fan base right now. And it's like kind of the, the civil war, the arguments. Ben's... Someone sacked... Someone banned Ben's down there and said, Happy 50th. Less of that. Although I will be 35. Halfway to 70. <sighs> Damn. Anyway. Um... Ricky, you're saying it's your daughter. Is it Bethany or Beck Ganny? I'm guessing it's Bethany. Is 10 on Saturday. I'll give her a shout out. How are you doing, Bethany? If you're a United fan, hopefully you're going to enjoy 10 to 20 more than you may have enjoyed any sort of football memories you've had between 0 and 10 because it's not been that good. And I feel sorry for any kids who have had to go through in school <laughs> in these last 10 years, man. I said that. I love school as a kid. Not because of the education. I hate the education part of it, but I loved being a United fan when I was at school. Uh, but look, Waffle, waffle, waffle. <sighs> Thank you all for tuning in. I hope you enjoyed the show today. Uh, a little bit ranty at the start. But yeah, when when you put as much effort and time as I put into United People's TV, you're going to get frustrated when you see others just taking the low-hanging fruit approach. And especially when they ultimately get the attention. Because we live in an attention economy. And the way you get attention is by saying outlandish stuff, is by using clickbait. And that's uh, so, so, so it's a so frustration. But anyway, thank you all for tuning in. I will be here tomorrow as always. I'll be here at lunchtime today, not sure what with, but hopefully with something that's a little bit good. Take it easy, drop a like on the video if you can. I'll see you soon.